I'm Rob Moore. And I'm Lee Moore. This is the Chinese Literature Podcast. So we've got a, I don't know if it's a doozy like we normally have, but we've got kind of a famous uh, famous gentleman you, here. You may have heard of this, this writer. He was an up-and-comer in the uh, 50s and 60s. And His uh, name is, is that Mao? Mao what? Mao, Mao Tse... Satong, right? Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong. Yeah, that's right. No, no, his name is Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong. You may know him as the uh, butcher of Beijing, the leader of the founder and leader of the PRC, the one who set the Chinese people free, the one who at Tiananmen Square Gate said the Chinese people have stood up. Mm-hmm. That's the him. East is red. The East is red. Mao. And he is the sun sometimes. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Of course, we're joking. As this is the, the, if, if you're going to know a Chinese historical figure, this is probably going to be the one you know. Absolutely. Yeah. But what most people don't know is that he was also a poet, and not the sort of person just scribble something on a receipt here and there. But like he's he was serious about it. He's considered sort of a good poet by a lot of Chinese people. Not everyone agrees. That well, it's, he's it's a, a great it's a, poet. It's a fun question because when I was living in, in Tianjin, uh, people were divided. Everyone I talked to was sort of divided. There were people who thought he was a brilliant poet, and there were people who thought he was total crap. Uh, in <laughs> fact, I, I got some students together once, outside of class, just to say, I want to see what you do thing. And I said, we're going to make a Chinese canon. Like, what are the key texts in Chinese literature that everyone has to read? Most eras, like the Tang and the Song, people more or less agreed on. I mean, they might not agree on all the poems by Du Fu, but... Most of the greatest hits. It's like if you decide to put Nirvana on a best of 90s list. There's a couple of songs everyone's going to agree on. Sure. But the dividing line was Mao. Really? So half of the room was like, Mao is an amazing poet. The other half were like, are you nuts? Mao suck. Why are we reading Mao still? Was this being, were they actually talking about politics? Like those who didn't like Mao's politics didn't like his poetry? Well, but this is, see, this is the interesting question. How do you read poetry by someone so famous for not poetry, you know? I mean, imagine if if Robert Frost was this well-known. If Robert Frost was the president of the United or, States for 40 years. Or, or could I suggest, I mean, President George W. Bush just came out with a book of paintings. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, he came out with a book of paintings. And there's this question about his artistry. I think it's the same thing. I mean, huh. obviously Mao, I think, is a larger figure historically um, and I, I'm going to go out on a limb there and say he's probably a better poet than George W. Bush as a painter. <laughs> I though, think so. Though, though George W. Bush has shown some interesting skills. I mean, the, so, so like, I think you can think of it in okay. those terms. I, the only thing I would say to that is that Mao casts a far larger shadow Absolutely. over China Absolutely. than Bush does over... So it's really... I don't really think you can compare this to any other case. And so one of the reasons we decided to do this was sort of a personal challenge. Like how do you talk do you about talk a poem? About yeah. I mean <laughs> how do you I, talk about Mao as a poet? I mean we've all read if you've studied anything with modern China, you've you've take studied read tons of stuff by We're and here about at Mao. the University of Oregon and right now they're actually doing an entire seminar just on Mao. And so when you talk about the poetry of someone like this you're saddled with some interesting problems because, like you just mentioned, if you say, I think this is a pretty solid poem, is that the same thing as saying, say, Stalin wrote great poetry? I mean, are you saying you approve of this person? How do you approve of the work and not the person? We're, we're doing this on uh, April 21st, mm. and that, of course, is the day after Hitler's birthday. Can you... Can, could Hitler conceivably be a good poet? I mean, he was an artist, he, or he, he tried to be an artist. There's this question, you know, like, what, like, was, I mean, I have heard there's a documentary, there is a documentary that I have seen, and this documentary suggests that Nazism was, in, in fact, an, an entirely an artistic program written on a political stage. Hmm. And I, I guess we have to ask the question, is Maoism an artistic project mm -hmm. or uh, you, you mentioned kind of revolutionary spirit, a project about the revolutionary spirit that succeeded and then just went too far? And that's, that's a really interesting point, actually, because Mao was very serious about art. And when I say art, I mean not just visual art, but – 
film, literature, art, the art. arts. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mao was very serious about art. He um, he delivered lots of lectures. He wrote articles. The he, most famous was the 1942 lecture on art in Yenna, yeah. um, mm-hmm. which definitely defines modern Chinese artistry. Even to this day, I believe Xi Jinping in the last few years has reported uh, and you know kind of gone back to that but it it's very much the message of that talk is art must serve the party and it must serve the people but of course what gets fuzzy is what does that mean um does it have to represent the people as they are because you know when mal was writing if you were to and in fact the works that did represent the people as they were usually got canned because the people were hurting they were poor not everywhere, of course, but if you were to publish a piece that demonstrated how poor people were, that wouldn't get published. So it's not as they are. Oftentimes it was as they could be one day. As they should be. Should be under communism someday. So it's Soviet realism. Soviet realism, socialist realism, socialist but it realism. came out of the Soviet Union, yeah. Um, <laughs> and so I think that's an interesting point, that, that Maoism was a cultural project because um, – the Cultural Revolution and that sort of the decades before that did lots of interesting things to spread – we would view it as fairly crappy art, but art nonetheless. I, I wrote a paper once on uh, on um, CCP, the, the Chinese Communist Party film crews, these, these groups of guys, girls, people who would get film equipment at the party's behest and go out into these really remote regions of the country – and screen propaganda films. I mean, they would climb mountains and ford rivers with their with their camera equipment and then set up in a village. That's an awfully dramatic thing to do if really culture is neither here nor there, you know? Yeah, I mean, the Cultural Revolution was, at its heart, a cultural project. We forget that it wasn't just a political project, but it had cultural aims. Right, and although I have no particular approval of the 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 disaster (laughs) very few people do one of the fascinating things is that there were places where it arguably worked where these these sort of young cadres the the red guards that were set out of the capitals into the countryside which was sort of mal's way of getting them out of the way because they'd run amok there were places where this worked they went out there and there were villages who had never heard Bach before, and they would play the violin. Of course, he wouldn't, shouldn't have been playing Bach, but whatever. It wasn't a perfect effort. But Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I despise Mao personally, and I think the Cultural Revolution may have been one of the greatest uh, disasters of the 20th century. Along, or I think Maoism may have been one of the greatest disasters of the 20th century. But I think you have to ask... Every time something happens historically, there are winners and losers, and who are the winners and who are the losers, and how many of them are there? And I think, you know, that, that, uh, I mean, even if we're going to condemn it, we have to know, we have to answer those questions first before we condemn it. So, which doesn't necessarily answer the question why we're reading a poem by Mal. No, it doesn't. Uh, Although I would say. Or should we even be reading a poem by Mal? Should we, should we just say, but this is the thing, is that. I think far too often we're – I mean we have all the ammunition we need to dismiss the Cultural Revolution, Maoism, and General Sin. But one of the dangerous things <laughs> is in boiling it down to a few simple historical bullet points and then moving on um, because there are people who read and enjoy Mao's poetry, not people who are funded by the party to do this, to be the mouthpiece. But yeah, they're enjoy. real people. And – So there's a challenge involved, and I think – I don't have a a ready answer for the question aside from the fact that it's just interesting to consider that this was a person who shaped more than anyone else in the 20th century the course of China and wrote poetry, which I I think most people would agree even in China. It's not exactly the most accessible art form. I mean there are – there. You know, there, there are poetry sections in Chinese high schools and whatnot, just like there are in American high schools. But it's not the, the go-to literature for, you know, the, not, the taxi not, driver. Yeah, it's or not the, what you see people reading on the bus. Or no, the no. Even Mao's poetry. So why don't we bring up the poem first? And yeah. We'll see if we can. Um, do you want to try to read the Chinese and the English since it's fairly short? Okay. Let's just read the English. Lee, Lee's giving me the, the, the head shake here, which I, I think I kind of agree with because no one's going to check it anyway. <laughs> so 
I'll read the English translation, and it's a fairly rough translation. We didn't spend hours and hours perfecting. And we'll post this on the site. Yes, yes. This is the very last that we know of poem that Mao wrote, 1975. He died in 1976, yes. so just shortly after this. And he's for, in poor health for a long time. Yeah, he was in poor health for a long time. So this poem is is in 1975, and it's an interesting one. I'll read the translation we came up with, and we'll talk about it. We're we're roughly translating the title as speaking of heartfelt or deep emotions. So here's the poem. Loyal and steadfast towards the country in its troubles, did I ever fear to face execution? Now all under heaven is red, and on whom does the nation depend for its defense? The task is still not complete. The body is weary. The hair is autumnal. This generation of yours and mine, will it endure to see its wish fulfilled, or will it lose it irrevocably? Fairly melancholy poem, really. Yeah, I mean, he is facing death, though, and he's wondering... I I mean, I kind of wonder, is he wondering whether or not his project will be complete, or is he looking back on his life and going, man, I screwed up a lot, and I'm just going to blame it on like my project not being complete? Well, I think, well, I think this is this is the, the interesting place to start. Is how, can you possibly detach this poem from all the events of his life? Yeah, because I don't, I absolutely don't think you can. I, I don't think you can. But at the same time, to say, for example. The task still not complete, the body is weary, the hair is autumnal, must refer to his political situation at the time is tricky. Because at the very same time, if you were just to read this poem, the hair is, first of all, the word autumnal is yeah. very... I mean, it's a very strange word in Chinese, or it's not a strange word in Chinese. It's a little bit of a strange usage. I think it sounds weirder in English in our translation, mm-hmm. but I'm glad we went with that because it just literally means fall or autumn. So let, let's highlight this last line because that, that goes directly to the question you yeah. were just asking. This generation of yours and mine, will who it is, endure... Who is that you're in mine? Well, that, hang on, let me finish okay, the line. Sorry. They will ask. Sorry. This generation of yours and mine, will it endure to see its wish fulfilled or will it lose it irrevocably? And this lose it irrevocably, it's kind of this sense that like you're throwing something into the river and it's flowing east and just going into the ocean. You don't have any control over it. Right. Remember all rivers in China flow, pretty much flow east. Right. Yeah. Um, and in fact, the, in the Chinese, the actual term is dongliu, which is yeah. flowing east. Yeah. Right. Um, so this generation of yours and mine, Lee asks the question, who's yours and mine? Who's exactly. the you and who is the I? I mean, this is literally ni Mm-hmm. So, yeah, who is, I mean, the, the, the my, the, the I there is clearly Mao, I think. And what's interesting, because the, the two terms are ni, wo, which is singular you, singular I. So it's addressing the reader, but I mean, is that referring to Mao's generation and a different generation, a younger generation, I suppose? Or is it referring to... Mao personally as the I and you as the reader, mm-hmm. whatever your generation is. Right. In in which case that could be any generation. It could be still continuing to this day, the Ni. Uh, and it's interesting because if it is in fact Mao's generation, um, then we're fairly limited as to how to read this, right? Mm-hmm. But if it's our generation, that would suggest that Mao's expecting this project to continue into the future when there is a different you, a different me, to be reading this. But he's saying that the project is not complete, but despite the fact that everywhere is red, all under heaven is red. That's Mm -hmm. literally what that means. All under heaven is red. How, what is the project then? What is the thing that he's trying to accomplish? Wasn't he trying to get communism spread Mm 
everywhere in mm -hmm. China, and he accomplished that. So what what was left? And if to all under heaven is, and I should specify here, this this is what what makes reading Mao somewhat interesting is that Mao was never a fully sort of quote unquote modern poet. He's bringing in a lot of classical references and ways of writing that make him a little a little anomalous. Yeah, really. this feels kind of like halfway in between a modern poem in Chinese and a classical Tang Dynasty. Like for example, when we read "All Under Heaven Is Red," what it literally says is "Tian Xia." That's the "All Under Heaven," mm -hmm. but that's a very classical reference, and it would have referred to the area that we now know as China. Sort of. I mean, it's kind of ambiguous right. what it refers to. Right. But it, it's easily you can easily read this as China. It's right. not. It doesn't say Zhongguo. It doesn't say China or our. It's a nation. much more poetic reference. Exactly. Right. So, if "All Under Heaven" is red like Lee just mentioned, that would sort of technically mean that we've succeeded, that everything is communist. But as we know from the period that preceded this, which was the Cultural Revolution, a period when Mao essentially decided that things had begun to just go off the rails. Well, or he had decided that things had not gone off the rails enough. Right. Or, that you know, the, they're, they're coming out of a period where uh, things are becoming more stabilized under the leadership of people like Zhou Enlai and Deng Xiaoping. And so Deng Xiaoping's brought out of jail at this point right. and then put back into jail shortly mm -hmm. after. <laughs> shortly after. It didn't He's, last long. Yeah. But he eventually becomes, he eventually does last long, but right. not in this period. So what's, it, what's an interesting way to read this is that Mao has lived to see China become communist, A, He's lived long enough to see China enter the world stage because Nixon has already visited China by this point, affirming its status. Yeah, yeah right. Um, it, has, it has taken its place. So technically he's lived to see this project completed, and yet it's not finished for him yet. I said yet twice, whatever. I'm not much of a poet. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I'm not much of a poet. So Rob well, says that, but he actually writes poetry. I did. I don't write much anymore. We maybe, maybe one day you'll be reading my poetry in this context. Like, how do we talk about someone as awful as Rob and bad, reads poetry? Bad, uh, good novelists all start out as bad poets. It's, it's probably and Rob and I are both bad poets. I agree. Um, or maybe I'm a good poet and a bad novelist. <laughs> um, but what, what still remains to be fulfilled? If everything under heaven is read, if China has taken the world stage as a communist nation or socialist nation anyway... What's what's not completed? What's he missing? Um, I don't know. It's, it's kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah, and it's interesting to think about. I I, I um I, I mentioned to Lee right before this podcast that one of the um, judgments I've heard about Mao, I forget who was a friend of mine in China, who said that Mao was a poet, not a politician. Which is to say that he had this sort of revolutionary romantic spirit that makes for a great leader in wartime, the sort of person who can help you overthrow a government, not the sort of person who can help you implement economic policies. If that's true, then simply realizing a political goal, we overthrew the nationalists, now we have a communist government, uh, that sort of personality may not be able to ever see the end of a project. Because just having a socialist government doesn't necessarily mean that everything works in a socialist way like you would imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and so this last line is interesting because if this is indeed the last poem he ever wrote, or at least the last one we have, there's a lot of ambiguity. He doesn't know really what's going to happen. It, are things going to work the there's way he wants them to? A or, ton of ambiguity. Yeah. Here. Or will it all just go belly up? Or, I mean, what is his project even that he's talking about mm -hmm. leaving incomplete? Incomplete. Yeah. yeah. He is seeing, the, this is the end of the Cultural Revolution, and even the most diehard optimist would have a hard time seeing the end of the Cultural Revolution as a great victory. It ended in total failure. Um, and there's a sense in this poem in which the writer is aware that things are not the way they should be. The writer is aware that he himself is old, is dying, and is truly not sure what his legacy is going to be. And it manifests itself physically. I mean, when he talks about his hair growing mm -hmm. autumnal uh, and his body being tired, mm -hmm. it's, 
it's a physical man. It's a physical thing, but I think it's also a political project. Sure, I mean, he's talking about the body as in the body politic. Mm-hmm. And that could be too. Mm-hmm. The hair is this kind of old, this old policy that's just kind of falling apart, and not really getting to where it's mm-hmm. supposed to go. Yeah, there's that. There's it's an interesting one too because um, Chinese socialism follows closer with Leninism and Stalinism than Marxism. And, of course, Lenin's conception of socialism was a sort of perpetual revolution. That in order to one day have socialism, every generation has to have essentially a new kind of revolution to get rid of the old junk, right? That's almost Jeffersonian. Almost, yeah. It really is. It, it, it's inter- an interesting comparison. But, yeah, no, it is. It's very similar. Um, and if that's the case, then um, the task is still not complete. It's a sort of – it's it could be seen as sort of a winsome – personal regret or boilerplate Leninism. Of course it's not complete. There has to be a revolution all the time. You know, we're still going, right? Do you think there's an answer? This is the way I read it. I read it as someone who's reached the end of his life and sees that the project that seems to have been completed is not. Because clearly China under socialist rule is not what Mao thought it would be And this poem is the result. This poem is him saying, this is not what I want it to be, and I truly have no idea what's going to happen to it. I would suggest another reading. Go for it. I would suggest there's a sense of guilt Hmm. in this poem that he's trying to mask. He's saying, I didn't complete my project, despite the fact that everybody is socialist in China. I didn't complete my project. He's looking back on it, and he's saying, like, it's not complete because I personally failed. I did some things that are wrong. Mm. And I don't know. I mean, like, so I, I'm just kind of thinking about the color red. Mm. The color red is definitely associated with so, so, socialism at this time. But, you know, the the way it gets that association with socialism is through blood mm. and revolution. Mm. And I've got to kind of ask. So I'm looking at the that line. And, you know, it says nowadays all under heaven or in China is covered in red. Is that about the massive loss of life? Is that guilt about the massive loss of life that he's caused? And if you look at the next line, who will we depend on to defend the nation? It's almost this question of did he do something that actually killed all these people who are, who would have been defending China? And, and Mao did caused the deaths of lots of people who would have been used to kind of be defenders of the nation. Like that is a huge concern. One of the reason Mao, one of the reasons Mao turns toward, he pivots towards the United States in 1972 is because he's concerned about a Soviet attack. And you've got to ask this line, you've got to ask, is this line, Jiang Shan, Kao Shei Shou, like, who are we going to depend on to defend the nation? Is that a reference to the blood on his hands mm-hmm. that he has maybe kind of like murdered lots of people who would defend the nation from the Soviets? That's definitely a viable reading. I, I don't know that I read it with quite that level of guilt um, because All Under Heaven is Red is such by now sort of a an established – well, not those specific four characters, but the East is Red is such a canonical – Mao phrase that it's hard for me to read that as a sort of um, heartfelt cry. But if someone could have read it in that way, Mm -hmm. it would have been Mao himself who constructed Mm -hmm. that image of himself. But now here's what's interesting. If let's, let's, let's take the possibility that Lee's reading is in fact exactly what Mao was up to, which is almost, almost exactly what it is because Lee is always right. And I am (laughs) almost always right. I did not say that. (laughs) It was implied. Um, (laughs) Why do we read poetry by Mao? One of the reasons we do, or should, is because of the way it problematizes an otherwise very easy narrative. One of the dangers in reading about uh, demagogues and dictators is it becomes so very easy to to dismiss them. You know, you can say... Wow, look at what Mao did. Let's just move Mao out of the way. It's incredibly easy to dehumanize Mao, as I oftentimes do. It's easy. It's it's I so mean, easy. I mean, it, he killed millions of people. 
Yeah, or was it, it the, in charge of a project that did, one or the other? But Just just admit it. He murdered lots of people. I mean, that's it. Personally, <laughs> he was out there with a gun. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but it is, you know, um, and, and there there will be people who say we should just continue to see them as essentially monsters. The problem is that makes it much too easy to draw a line between the us and the them, mm-hmm. right? As long as we can have the bad people on this side of the line, that guarantees... That as long as we're not that, well, then we're good. We don't have to actually worry about ourselves or what we do as long as they're over there. So we're not monsters because right. we didn't kill millions of people. Right. Mao is just a priori a monster. Right. So, but in, in, by saying that, I'm not saying this poem makes Mao a wonderful deep person no but i agree with you i think it forces us to ask you know how different how do you read him yeah this is if you simply take uh historical events and dismiss the literature which frequently is the thing that makes it impossible to just read a history book and move on you have to ask well what do we make of this person and these these things so if i could just go ahead and kind of draw this to a conclusion and summarize if you want to understand Chinese history, you need to listen to the Chinese literature podcast because reading history is absolutely useless. Total literature. That is exact, and not just about literature. <laughs> this podcast, in particular, will make it's the key to understanding everything. everything. Yeah. not just about China, but everything. everything. If you want to be a good person <laughs> and not become a monster, you must listen to this podcast. I think that's. That's a wonderful application, Lee. Um, <laughs> we should end here, really, but it's punchy. But do you have any, any other sort of final thoughts? Like, do you have a, a final thought as to why read a poem by Mao and not just leave us with the historical Mao? I have a better question. Go for it. So we started out wondering whether or not this is a good poem. Right. And whether Mao... <laughs> we didn't even talk poem. about that. <laughs> Do you think this is a good poem? I don't really like it very much. Although I will say that there are sections like the third line, which we translated as the task is still not complete. The body is weary. The hair is autumnal, which is frankly a fairly lovely line. Funny, yeah. It's it's each of each those uh, clauses are three characters in the Chinese, which is very much a classical rhythm. Um, I I kind of like it if you... You like Mao. That's it. If, if, you it's take, if you take my bloodstained hands reading of it, I think it kind of means he's like grappling with his legacy. Mm. And that I enjoy. Mm-hmm. I don't know if this is great poetry. I agree with you that that uh, fourth line is interesting and, and quite beautiful poetically. The rest of the poem is less so. Right. But... Yeah, I think there is some value to looking at this. And what's interesting, and this will be my sort of closing thought, is Mao himself, if you read his poetry, did not know what was going to happen. And it's fascinating to read the 20th century socialist project in China through the lens of a body of work that truly doesn't know what's going to happen. It's unsure of itself. It's, it's to say that even the dictator, even the, the great helmsman, as he's called in Chinese, really wasn't sure where it was going to go. And at the end of his life, didn't know where it was going to go. And that makes all the things that happened in the 20th century in socialist history a little more interesting. Because this wasn't some long-term plan dreamed up in a boardroom. This was spur of the moment, sometimes impromptu decisions hmm. that oftentimes failed. And at least in the case of this person, was the source of a great deal of of sadness, melancholy, uh, doubt. Hmm. Uh, it's a very different reading of the century. I think that's a great place to end. I do too. We'll have, if we don't already, one or two other things, quote unquote, great literature from this period. Uh, it's worth reading for the, the reasons we just mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.